Good evening. It's a joy to be here, assemble with you all today. It's always a blessing to be with God's people. As I said uh, already in this uh, gathering uh, yesterday, I've looked forward to being here. I've never gotten to be uh, with this congregation before, and it's been a, already a great blessing to be part of what, uh, from all I can see, is a family. And that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way God's people work. So I'm thankful to be able to be here. I dare say that if we were to ask uh, from person to person, work our way around this auditorium tonight, that every adult at least, and probably also a number of the young people, would say that they have uh, struggled to know how to teach their friends and their neighbors, and that in the midst of that, periodically, one of them brings up a passage that we don't know how to handle. We don't know what to do with it. This week, as we study the concept of hearing God speak, we've got to come to a great realization. And that's the first thing I want to talk about tonight. And that is that the context is the key to understanding. If you look at the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 37, toward the end of the verse, Jesus simply says, go and do likewise. But what are we supposed to do? Uh, there's an old joke, I suppose it's a joke, I'd hate to think it's anything other than that, uh, that uh, someone came along, some preacher, and said that the scripture said, uh, Jesus said, uh, First of all, the scripture said that Judas went out and hung himself. Jesus said, go thou and do likewise, and whatsoever thou doest, do it quickly. Well, anybody with good sense knows that all three of those passages are totally taken out of context. Uh, they are not together in one place. That is not the force of what Jesus was having to say. So what is this, go thou and do likewise? To answer that question we must go to the context. So go back in the book of Luke, we're in chapter 10, and we want to begin particularly to look at this beginning early in the chapter, verse 25. And here's what we find. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? A remarkable thing that we want to observe here that may help us at times in teaching those around us is the realization that you can do greater teaching with questions than you can with statements. Jesus very often did that. He would turn the tables on them, and particularly here, he turns the tables because the man who is asking the question is a lawyer. He has spent his life studying the law of Moses. What does he mean asking this question? Does he not know the answer? And Jesus, by asking the question, forces his hand. He has to demonstrate, well, yes, I do know the answer, and he does that. So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. <laughs> well, see, he knew the answer all along. He was trying to trap Jesus, but in the process, he demonstrated, uh, at least at first, an ignorance of the great law that he had studied. Jesus, by turning the tables, forced the man to reveal what he really did know the answer. Now it's the lawyer that's on the spot because it's obvious he knew the answer, and so listen to his response in an attempt to justify himself. And who is my neighbor? Now Jesus tells a parable that is very familiar probably to everybody in this audience tonight. Certainly those of us that are of any age at all, young people, children, even know the parable of the Good Samaritan. There was a man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. By the way, 
You know, when we talk about going down, that, that'll be what I will do at the end of this week. I'll go down. But when we say that, we're going, we mean we're going south. Or if you go up, you're going north. Now, that's not always really up or down, is it? By altitude. It may not be up or down. It's, it's just the way we do things. But in Scripture, if it says going down, there's one thing you'd be assured of. It's down. The city of Jerusalem sits up at about 2,500 feet above sea level. The city of Jericho is down right next door to the Dead Sea, which is 1,300 feet below sea level. Was the man going down? Well, that's not very hard to figure out, is it? He sure is going down. He's going down a very treacherous path. And I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of this path, but... It, it is a mountainous path, lots of rocks, lots of curves, plenty of places for robbers to hide. And so as he's going down, robbers fall in on him. And when they do, they take everything of value from him, including his clothing. They beat him and they leave him for dead. Well, along comes a priest. And the priest is one that you would have thought would have immediately attended to his needs, but no. He made sure to get on the other side and went right on by. Then comes the Levite, and I'm almost positive I must have seen him on one of our interstates in the United States. Because when somebody has a wreck, you know, there are people that just have to get over close to wherever the wreck is and take a good look. And they slow down and bog the rest of us down for, for the rest of the day, just about, don't they? Well, the Levite is that kind of a fella. He goes over and takes a look, has to see what's going on, but then he passes by on the other side. At last comes a Samaritan. This Samaritan goes down to help the man. He treats his wounds with oil and wine. He bandages him. He puts him on his own beast of burden and carries him to an inn. He cares for him all night long. And then in the morning, when it's time for him to leave, he leaves money behind and urges the innkeeper to take care of this man and then makes a promise. When I come back, if he owes you any more, I will take care of it. I will pay it. And then Jesus asks the great question. Verse 36. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And the answer that comes back from the lawyer is, he who showed mercy on him. And it is then that Jesus says, go and do likewise. The point of the parable, the point that the Lord is striving to make here is that every man in need is my neighbor. He's your neighbor. We need to reach out to them. We need to care for them. Thus, go and do likewise. So the parable we understand, but what did we learn by looking at it in that way? I would suggest to you that we learn that context is really formed in three different ways in Scripture. That first of all, there is the verse itself. We looked at that verse, but what did it mean? We didn't know not looking by it all, at it all by itself. Second, we have what is called the immediate context. And the immediate context involves not just the verse, but the surrounding verses. And brethren, let me add this little point. Almost every time somebody uses a passage in a way that you've never heard it used before, you're not really sure why that's not right. You know it's not. You know the way they're using it is wrong, but you're not sure why. Let me give you a simple rule that works almost every time. Read five verses before, read the verse, and five after. And almost without fail, you're going to dispel the whole problem. It will go away. In fact, for the remainder of tonight, we're going to be demonstrating that over and over again so that we all understand what it takes. But there's a third aspect 
to context, and that is what usually is described as remote context. And the remote context is everything that Scripture has to say about that particular thing. For example, when you're thinking about remote context, it plays a tremendous role in what we often call the Jerusalem Conference. You may remember that when James proposes what they're going to write to the Gentiles, that he says we need to tell them to abstain from things strangled and from blood. And by the way, if it's strangled, blood's a problem because it's still in the body. So really, abstain from blood. And someone says, well then, the Gentiles did have to follow the law of Moses. No, they did not. Instead, this is an overarching principle, what sometimes is called a meta-principle. It actually goes back all the way to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 9. And when God is talking to not even Abraham, he's talking to Noah. And he tells Noah not to eat the blood because the life is in the blood. This is an overarching principle that started in the patriarchal age, is continued in the Mosaic age, and also extends even into the Christian age. Thus, the Gentiles were to keep a law that God established in the early times. Jesus did the same thing, if you think about it, with a question of marriage. They asked him a question that really comes out of Moses' discussion that he wrote in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 24. That's what the Pharisees asked in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus' answer goes back to the overarching principle, a principle that is established in Genesis chapter 2. And in that chapter, we find that a man and a woman are joined together, and they too become one flesh. And then Jesus says, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. It's an overarching principle. Don't tell me that marriage is something that just started in New Testament times. That's false. Marriage started in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And the rule has always been one man for one woman for life. Now somebody says, well, some of them married more than one woman. Yes, but that doesn't mean that God intended for them to. And that's important to realize. The law that God made in the early times extends to all times of God's dealings with man. So, no wonder then that someone a long time ago said a text without its context is just a pretext. And what's it a pretext for? Well, usually it's a pretext for teaching false doctrine. That's what it's for. So now, what I want to do for the remainder of the time tonight, having realized that context determines meaning, is I want to take up different things that you may have heard or you may hear one day, and we're going to try to use this rule to demonstrate very clearly that context will dispel our problems. Let me give you an example. The two sticks of the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. Someday... Some people may knock on your door and they may want to talk to you about their religion. They're usually extraordinarily kind. They're usually very well-dressed and very respectful. They also, most often, are full of smiles. I've found them to be that way every time that I've ever talked to them. As they come in, they will inform you that they have two inspired books. And then they'll take you to the book of Ezekiel. And we want to go there together. Let's look at what they're going to show you. Ezekiel chapter 37, begin at verse 15. And again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. Now then they're going to ask you a question. If you're like me, you may be a little bit caught off guard. I'd never thought 
about the question the first time it was put to me. What did they use sticks for back then? Well, I know they didn't play fetch with the dogs because dogs were bad things in the Old Testament. They ran in packs and they killed people sometimes, especially young people, children, or old people got separated from other folks. So I knew it wasn't that, but what did they do with sticks? I didn't think that they were thinking about building a fire. So what did they use them for? And the answer comes back, well, didn't they use them to roll up a scroll? Wasn't this their book? Well, yeah, they did roll them up in scrolls. Jesus read from the scroll, uh, reading from Isaiah. So yeah, sure, I, yeah, that's right. Well, then what we have here is two books. And it is clear that God intended for there to be two books. Now, they're going to actually narrow this down and explain it even more thoroughly because they're going to talk about the ten lost tribes of, guess what, Israel. And they have a book. And then they're going to talk about the tribes of Judah, the two tribes, and they have a book. But those, both of those books are inspired. Now, first, let me tell you, these people are being dishonest because they don't have just two books. They have at least four inspired books that I know of, and probably, given the amount of time since I last really delved into it, they probably have more because they believe in latter-day revelations. So they're not being honest with this text to begin with. Just forget everything else. But now what are the two sticks? We need to have an answer. And the Word of God will give it to us. Go back to the book of Ezekiel and let's keep reading. Pick up verse 18. And when the children of your people speak to you saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Well, we know a little bit more maybe, but we still don't know what the sticks are totally, do we? So let's keep going because the text continues to talk about it. Verse 21, Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Now stop. Is he talking about a book? No, he's talking about a people. It's very clear, isn't it? The text makes it clear as it can be. He's going to take Israel from out of the nations where they have been scattered. But keep going, because he didn't really stop there. He goes ahead, and I will uh, make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be their king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. So what are we learning? Two nations, not just two sticks, two nations. Two nations that had once been divided, Judah and Israel, but they're going to be reunited. How? Under one king. That's how they're going to be united. But really, they haven't stopped yet. God continues, David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes to do them. And so he's talking about David being king. But wait a minute. When Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost, he makes it clear that David was dead and buried. And in fact, they knew where his bones were right then. So is he talking about David or is he talking about the son of David? And it's obvious he's talking about the son of David. He's talking about the Messiah, the anointed one. In Greek it would be Christ, the anointed one. Those are the two words, Hebrew and Greek, for anointed. Who did they anoint in the Old Testament? Well, they anointed kings, right? Saul was anointed. David was anointed. They also anointed priests. 
Do you remember that Moses anointed his brother Aaron, for example, to be the high priest? And then who else did they anoint? They also anointed prophets. You may recall that Elijah anointed Elisha. Guess what? Jesus is the anointed in every sense of the word, not just a king. He is prophet, priest, and king. And the book of Hebrews makes that very clear. And so what are we talking about here? We're talking about the unification of all people under one king, Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about. Not two inspired books united as one, not at all. But instead, one king with one kingdom. Thus, on the day of Pentecost, when the apostle Peter stood up, what did he say? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Where is he seated? He's already told that, hasn't he? He's seated on the right hand of the throne of God. And it is because he is now seated there that this has been shed forth, which you now see and hear. I want you to think about this a minute. We already looked yesterday at the, at the beginning of this idea, Acts chapter 2, and the speaking in tongues and uh, languages, uh, which is, is very apparent there. But did you, did you also think, as you go down through there, there's more to that than that? That within that, he makes it very, very clear that what happened is what Jesus said would happen. In John chapter 16, Jesus said that, that he had to go away so that another comforter could come. And the word another in John 16 is one, one of the same type. Jesus was God come down to earth. The Holy Spirit is also God. And he's going to come with what purpose? Not to deliver a new message, but instead to deliver the message of Jesus in its entirety. So do we know Jesus made it to heaven? The answer is yes. How do we know? Because the Holy Spirit came. And that lets us know beyond a shadow of doubt that he made it. And he is now ruling as king, seated on the throne. So the two sticks. But what about this one? Some of you have already heard this. On this rock, I will build my church. It comes from Matthew chapter 16. I know of one religious group, I suspect a number of you know as well, that that religious group says that the rock in that case is a fellow by the name of Peter. And that Peter was the foundation on which the church was built. And they make lots of arguments based upon that. But I think that it comes because of misunderstanding of the context in which it is found. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16. We're going to pick up verse 13. And there it is that we find when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now stop. What's the question? You know, there used to be a commercial. I can't remember what it was, but some somebody out in the audience uh, would the fellow would say, uh, well, this is the answer. And the fellow would say, well, what's the question? Well, that's the point here. What's the question? The question is, who am I? We start with, who do the people say I am? But the question is always, who am I? And we need to watch that because it plays a critical role within this context. The answer comes back from the disciples. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, I'm going to give the people credit. They didn't know who he was for sure, but they knew where he came from. They knew he was a spokesman from God. That they knew. Now Jesus asks a second question, or is it really a second question? Listen to what he says. He says, but who do you say that I am? What's the question? It's the same question. Who am I? Who do the people say I am? Who do you say that I am? Now then, Peter gives the answer, and everybody knows that. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the question is, who am I? The correct answer is not just a spokesman from God, but 
the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the answer. And so now Jesus responds to Peter. And what does he say? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now wait a minute. How did the Father reveal that to him? Well, if Peter was present at the baptism of John in Matthew chapter 3, that may have been part of how he knew. Because when Jesus came up out of the water, the Spirit descended like a dove, and a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I may not know whether he was at the baptism of John, although I think Acts 1 says he was. Because they're looking for someone that was with them from the baptism of John to the ascension. That's who they're looking for. So was Peter there? I think he was there. But if you don't agree with that, then I know where he was. In Matthew chapter 17, we find Jesus going up on what we usually call the Mount of Transfiguration. And you remember that the disciples who he took with him were Peter, James, and John. And what did they see? They saw Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. Did you ever ask, what were they talking about? You know, the folks back home know that I'm a two-year-old. I never quit asking questions. So what, what were they talking about? Well, it's revealed. They were talking about Jesus' exodus. Isn't that interesting? Moses talking to Jesus about an exodus. But it's not an exodus in the sense that Moses had a part in an exodus. It's Jesus exiting this earth. That's what they're talking about. Well, Peter sees it, and you know, typical Peter, he's got to have something to say. Kind of reminds me of me sometimes. And so he speaks up very quickly, and he says, it's good for us to be here. Let us build three tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. And he's setting up an opportunity, apparently, to be with these three great spokesmen uh, for an endless period of time, or at least for a good period of time. And it's then that the other two are caught up out of their sight, and a voice out of heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. But you know, it didn't really stop with that. In fact, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, tells other things that also show that God's Son was His Son. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through Him in your midst, as you yourselves know. How many miracles, wonders, and signs did Peter see? Well, I'm not sure I could give you an answer. But I can tell you he saw a lot. He saw the water turned into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. He saw the resurrection of the widow of Nain's son. He saw the healing of the two blind men who were caused to be able to see. He saw the casting out of the demons that, was, that were called legion. He saw all of those things. He saw the resurrection of Lazarus, who'd been dead so long he was corrupted. Fourth day, he stinks. He saw all those things. And so God revealed to Peter who this is. This is my son. This is the Christ. Now, read the rest of the chapter and all of a sudden it makes a whole lot more sense as we go forward. Here's what he says. And I also say to you that you are Peter. By the way, that's a small stone. A throwing stone. Now, I don't want to mislead you. Those stones could be rather large. David picked up stones for his, for his. Uh, oh boy, now I've lost sling. Good, it came back. <laughs> All right, he lost, he got stones for his sling. I've seen pictures of some of those. They were about the size of a tennis ball. And knowing how fast, you know, some of these tennis players hit, you know, are able to hit a tennis ball, well, Coming out of a sling, that, that stone be going at a pretty good pace. It's no wonder that Goliath collapsed when he was struck in the forehead with that stone. But if that is still a, a throwing stone, so thou art Peter, a throwing stone, and upon this rock, and there the word is a, a foundation stone. <clears throat> but if you don't know that, if you don't know the language, it's okay. 
Because the reality is the rest of the story is found as we continue. I say also to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now notice what he had said in verse 17. Blessed art thou, Simon of Arjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Some translations have it to you. It what? What's the question? The question is, who am I? And the answer was, correctly set forth by Peter, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So what is the church going to be built on? The foundation of Jesus Christ. The confession that he is the Son of God. So that when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it's no surprise then that the Apostle Paul would say, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is... Jesus Christ. So upon this rock I'll build my church. What's the rock? It's the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then we have believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of us have run into that at least one time. Turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16. You remember what went on there. You remember that Paul and Silas were beaten. They were thrown into the inner part of the prison. They were, they were put into stocks there. You may remember also that Luke reports they were singing and praying at midnight when a great earthquake came. And what happened? The doors of the prison came open and the stocks fell off of them. And the jailer, seeing the doors open, thought that all the prisoners had escaped and he prepared to kill himself. Why? He's going to be held responsible for all those lost prisoners. That's why. But Paul calls out and says, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And it's then that the jailer rushes in, having called for a light, and he falls down and he asks a very, very important question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I am not certain that he understood the entirety of his own question. But I do know the answer that was given to him. It's found in verse 31. It's the one often quoted to us. And in, in it we find, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you and you will be saved, you and your household. All right, so believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now some people say, See, there's no work required to go to heaven. Well, that's false. In the book of, uh, of John, John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29, here's what we find. The multitude is speaking at first. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent me. So belief is a work of God. That's number one. But beyond that, what makes anybody think within the context that the jailer knew anything about Jesus Christ? I'm not certain there's anything that would tip us off to that. And in fact, the very next verse, verse 32 suggests that he may have known something, but he didn't know nearly enough. Listen to what it says. Luke writes, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. What does this mean, they spoke the word of the Lord to him? Well, turn to chapter 17, and let's see Paul in a different setting. This time, he's in Thessalonica. And in verse 3, we find, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Skip down to verse 18. Then certain Epicureans and Stoic philosophers encountered him. Of course, this is Mars Hill in Athens. And some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Skip on down, verses 30 and 31. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now, what did they tell the jailer about Jesus? I got a pretty good idea. I think you do too. They told him that he died, he was buried, and he's raised again the third day. That's the gospel. That's what Paul preached wherever he went. We already saw that yesterday. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, particularly verses 3 and 4. So now look at the response of the jailer to the preaching of the word. How does he respond? Verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, I'm going to draw a conclusion I think is reasonable here. And the conclusion is that the jailer repented. Somebody had given them those stripes. I assume it may have been the jailer. If so, or even if not so, he knew what had been done to them. He had participated in it in some fashion or another, at least by putting them in prison. How are you going to take back stripes? Well, you can't. But you can do the next best thing. You can wash those stripes and make sure that no dirt remains in them and they don't become infected. So he repents, and then what does he do? Then he and his whole household are baptized. Now watch verse 34 because it is critical. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, watch this, having believed in God. What did he do to believe in God? Repented and he was baptized. That's what he did to believe in God. And thus we have an answer when we find this statement Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you do that? You do it in penitent baptism. Now one more thing I want to talk about, and I've got to tell you that we're going to zero in on one context. The reality is there will be several that we could talk about. There are those folks today, you've run into them, you may know a number of them, who believe that uh, there is going to be a well, there are going to be two resurrections of the righteous. There's going to be a resurrection of the righteous before the rapture, and there's going to be a re resurrection of the righteous after the rapture. Now, an interesting thing is, is found here, and that is that Hal Lindsey, in writing his multiple books on this subject, has made this confession. Here's the way he says it. Now, don't go running for your concordance because the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, isn't that interesting? A preacher of the Word of God is preaching about something you can't find in the Bible. I find that to be a bit disturbing. Whether you do or not, I think you would. Now, he also goes on in, in the late great uh, planet Earth and also in another book. Now, all I can remember right now is generation. I can't remember the first part of the wording there. He, in both of those books, he goes to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And here's where he gets his re rapture. I want you to listen to it, but we're going to put it in context. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and here's what is read. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even... So God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. All right, there's their first resurrection. And they want to say that's, that is separated from the second resurrection. So keep on reading. Let's see if there's any separation in this context. Because I don't believe there is. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Does it sound like much of a separation to you? Oh, they are raised at two different moments, I suppose. The dead are raised first, but then the living are raised almost immediately to be caught up into a great airborne reunion with our brothers and sisters and with the Lord in the air. That's what it says. Well, the Thessalonian brethren struggled with this. They would struggled with it, first of all, because they thought if you died before Jesus came back, that then you're going to miss out. Well, Paul straightened that out here, didn't he? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But now, apparently they have a second problem. Now they believe that everybody's going to be raised and they're going to have to spend eternity with those very people who've been tormenting them. And so in, chapter, in the first chapter of the second book to the Thessalonian brethren, here's what Paul writes beginning at verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now let's stop just a minute. They're troubled. Well, boy, they are. In fact, the word that is used there, translated troubled, is the word flibo, and it carries with it the idea of being squeezed like a grape until the juice comes out. That's pretty bad pressure, I would say. Rest with us. Why? Because when the Lord comes back, he's going to punish. Now watch. Two categories of people. Them that know not God, them that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And be very careful. In Scripture, the concept of knowing is a concept of intimacy. Let me give you a demonstration. I'm not going to try to be crude, nor am I going to elaborate extensively. I think you'll understand. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son. I think they did more than say hello. And I think you know that, as surely as I do. So, no, not God. That is, we never came into an intimate relationship with Him. What could be more intimate in our relationship with God than being made a part of the body of God's own Son? I can't think of anything. It would be more intimate than that. The Lord has to say to the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the church is the body of Christ. Uh, for Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And so those that know not God are those who never obeyed the gospel. Well, then he says, and those who do not obey the gospel. And somebody says, well, that's the same group. No, because in the original language, the way it ought to literally be written is this, those who do not keep on obeying. It is a present tense verb. That means it's linear in nature. It keeps on going. If you don't keep on going, you're going to be lost. That's what it really says. And by the way, Hebrews chapter 10, 26 and following seems to agree with that, as does Hebrews chapter 6, uh, beginning what about verse 4 and going on in that chapter. Clearly, two groups are going to be punished. First, those who never obeyed the gospel. Second, those who did but didn't stay faithful. Not two separate resurrections. In fact, Jesus put it this way, even about the wicked. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave should hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life, they that have done evil under the resurrection of condemnation. Everybody's coming forth. In fact, they're coming forth in the same hour. If you read on within that context. And so what have we learned tonight? Well, I think we learned to put everything in context. And given the last context that we looked at, I want everybody in this audience to contemplate their own circumstance right now. Do you know God? Have you ever come into an intimate relationship with God? We saw the jailer do it. He repented and was baptized. And he came into an intimate relationship with God. Have you done that? It's important. It's the only way to really be saved. That's what he asked Paul and Silas, isn't it? What must I do to be saved? What shall I do to be saved? That's the big question. The answer is repent and be baptized. That's what the preaching of Jesus 
does every time. But then what about the rest of us? Some of us have already been baptized. We've already repented and been baptized. We were added to the church. We became intimate with God. But we've fallen away. We've strayed from the truth. What about us? Well, for us, we've got to be ready to confess our sins because he's faithful to forgive us. If you really want to be part of the great resurrection in the most positive of ways, then we urge you, come back or come for the first time into an intimate relationship with God. Come while we sing.